God, thank you so much for um, these students and for this time to be here with them, Lord. Um, thank you that we get to um, hear um, from your word, Lord. I just ask that all of us, including myself, can learn something and apply it to our lives for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever believed something before and you believed it your whole life? You believed it with all of your might that it was true and then one day you find out it's not. You find out the facts are wrong, you check the facts of it and you find out it's either all of it false, part of it false, or some of it's been exaggerated so it's not actually true and then your life is crushed forever. That's kind of what happens to most kids when they find out Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Leprechaun, the Easter Bunny aren't real. And if that moment is right now, I'm so sorry, you're feeling that. That like, oh my gosh, what? Go, just go fact check it with your mom and dad. Just go, go like ask them and then maybe they'll lie to you and then you'll be even more crushed. Anyways, so there's things in life that sometimes we operate out of believing that they're true and then one day we realize, okay, when we look at the facts of it, it's not actually true. And there's things as big as like Santa Claus, which is a big deal, especially to my three-year-olds, or there's things that I have no idea what that is, or whatever that noise is. Or <laughs> there's things that we operate out, just things we say in the everyday life. So today we're going to do a little bit of a fact check ourselves. I'm going to give you guys a fact. You're going to tell me if you think it's true or it's false, and I'll, we'll just fact check it. Are you guys ready? Okay, so have you ever heard someone tell you that carrots improve your vision? True or false? False, it doesn't. That's just your parents' way to tell you to eat vegetables. Don't believe the lies. Okay, what about this one? Um, coffee stunts your growth. Fact check, false. It actually, the facts of it is that it affects your loss of calcium, but not enough to actually affect your bones. So drink as much caffeine as you want, right? Um, what about the Great Wall of China is visible from space? Anyone hear that before? Who thinks it's true? Brayden, you false. Fact check, it's not. It's no, it's not. Go to space, you check the facts, you can't see it. Sorry, okay. Okay, the tallest mountain, what is the tallest mountain? fact check. Is it right? No, it's not actually. So they've lied to you. They've completely lied to you. It is the tallest mountain above sea level, but the tallest mountain is actually in Hawaii, Mount uh, Kia. It's like a mile longer than Mount Everest, which is really sad, you know, just like crushes your heart. I operated out of that like belief forever. So I went to Nepal, saw Mount Everest. Cool. Didn't do anything awesome. Okay. What about this one? This fact, some of the older folks in here probably believe this as true, and then it got changed in our science books, and it's the fact of Pluto being a planet. Did you guys know it was a planet once? Yeah. Did you know it's not a planet anymore? Like, who does that? Who changes the facts of that and just ruins your whole life? Like, you know how hard it is to memorize all the planets? There's the sun, the earth. I don't even know what they are. Anyways. Okay, this one, these are two survival ones that are very important that we're going to fact check. Um, when you get stung by a jellyfish, you should pee on it. True or false? False. Your pee actually has. <laughs> oh, okay, there we go. Travis, all knowing Travis. But guess what? We don't even know if that's true because we haven't checked the facts. We don't know. We don't know. Anyways, we digress. You actually, so when you get stung by a jellyfish, the pee is actually more acidic and it'll just make yourself burn more and scream more and be humiliated with someone else's urine on you or yourself. I mean, it depends on where you get stung. I, whatever. Okay, this one, another survival tip. Have you ever heard that lightning strike does not strike twice in the same place? I've heard of that. Guess what it does. So if lightning strikes here and you're like, oh, this is the perfect, safest place on the planet Earth to be, yeah, it's not actually true. You could die. You really could die. This is a life-saving thing. Okay, this one, this one's really important to fact check. Did you know that we believe that the light comes from the sun? False or true? It's true. It is true. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, at least you guys. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Are you doubting, like, how the world is created? Anyways, <laughs> there's all these facts and things that you've probably been told growing up or you believe. And we're in a new series called Fact Checkers where we don't want you just to believe what you're told, believe what you hear on Instagram, believe what your parents tell you, believe what I say here on this microphone because we're at church. We want you to actually fact check it for yourself. We want you to be a fact checker. And some of the most important things that you can fact check in your life is what you believe about God, about the Bible, about yourself. So in this series, we are going to be fact checkers, checking out what we believe, why we believe what we do. And one of the most important things before we can even dive into this fact checking, investigating the facts, is, okay, what are we, like, holding the standard of truth against? So if we're going to look at, like, what, something about God or something about ourselves, how do we know what's true? What's the standard by which we're measuring its truth? 
and that would be the Bible. Because you see, if you have your Bibles open to John 17, it says in John 17, verse 14, this is Jesus talking. He says, I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. All throughout the Bible, it says that the Bible, God's word, is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 1, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, saying that Jesus is the truth. His message is truth. The Bible is truth. This is a standard by which we can fact check things about why we believe, what we know about God, what we know about ourselves, what we know about living. We can use the Bible as our standard for truth. But here's the question. Why, why is the Bible our standard for truth? How do, how do we even know, like, this is reliable? How do we even fact check the Bible? Because growing up, when I went to Sunday school, someone told me, like, okay, like, how do you know, like, the Bible's true? Because uh, the Bible says it's true. So the Bible's true because it says it's true. So Santa's true because Santa says he's true. The tooth fairy is true because the tooth fairy says they're true. You see, we get stuck in this circular argument of, like, okay, why do I believe the Bible? How do I know it's true? How do I know it's reliable? Well, so we're going to get super nerdy here for a moment, but if you have, like, a textbook, like, that you list, uh, read at school um, or this historical document, they're going to tell you it's true based on these certain facts, these certain criteria of how you know it's true. And so we're going to get nerdy for a little bit. The way we can know that the Bible is accurate, reliable, just like any other historical document, is by the one and only Chick-fil-A potato waffles. Yes, you heard me correctly. Chick-fil-A potato waffles. Anyone have those before? Anyone like them? Is that your favorite waffle fries? Anyone? Okay, here's a picture of them. They're so good. And then you dip them into the... Um, that amazing sauce, Chick-fil-A sauce, you know, it's so good. Um, technically, they're called Chick-fil-A potato waffle potato fries, but we're going to call them potato waffles for the sake of today because why not? We're doing it. That's my truth, okay? So we're going to go with that. Um, so we're going to use this acronym of Chick-fil-A potato waffles to tell you how you can know the Bible is a reliable source that we can actually use for fact-checking. Because if we don't know that we can use the Bible for the things that we believe to fact-check, then why are we doing it? We might as well just use our brains, use our experience, use our feeling, use Travis who blurts out things in the middle of a sermon. So we're going to do this together. There's a space for you at the top of your note sheet if you want to write down the acronym of what this means. But I will, if you're in, um, like, super want to nerd out on this with me or see a longer sermon on this, I have tons of links I can send you from pastors here at the church where they've given like full like two-hour messages on let me prove to you why we can trust the Bible. But today we're just going to stick with Chick-fil-A because who doesn't like Chick-fil-A? Don't answer that if you don't. That's just terrible. Like, oh my gosh, like terrible. Okay, so C for Chick-fil-A stands for accurate copying. C, copying, accurate copying. When I say copying, I literally mean copying, like copying the words, copying, write it down. Let's say we're in this room, and suddenly the ceiling opens up, and a cloud comes down, and Justin Bieber is on it, and he comes down, he strums his guitar three times, and then says, what's up, homies? And we're all like, oh my gosh, my life has changed forever. I'm going to start a blog and write down what I saw. And so we write down what we saw, and we say, we were at church, and the ceiling opened up. A cloud came down. Justin Bieber was on it. He strung three times and said, what else, what's up, homies? And so I write that down, and that's my blog. And then Jillian decides to write that down, and she says, Justin Bieber comes down on a cloud and says, what's up, homies? She didn't have the part of the, dr the three str string, I can't even speak, the three, I don't know how to play guitar, strums? I was going to say drum, strings, whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> Clearly not musical. The <laughs> worship team are laughing at me. Anyways. But then Taylor's like, I'm going to write this down as well. And he says that Taylor Swift comes down and says, like, she's on the clouds and she strums her guitar three times and says, what's up, homies? So clearly we have a discrepancy here. So how do we know who's true? How do we know that these documents that's being written down of what this extreme event happened, how do we know it's true? Well, with any document that you're going to, like, look at to see if it's true, there's three things they measure. The first one. It's the length of time from the event and when it was written. So the length of time from when Justin Bieber comes in here to when it was written. Then you're also going to look at the number of copies written. And then you're going to look at the differences in the copies. So if I write this immediately after Justin Bieber comes down, I have a pretty good memory, right? Well, 10 years from now, I might forget and I might think maybe it was Taylor Swift. Or maybe he strummed his guitar five times. 
So the closer you are to the event of writing it down, of copying it, the more credibility you have. The more people that write it down, if all of us wrote a blog, we have even more credibility. And then when we look at the differences, we're like, okay, Taylor was wrong when he said five strums because everyone else in the room said three, so it must be three. So we'll just say that Taylor has bad memory. So that's how we know. That's how we know something's credible. So when you look at anything in history um, versus the Bible, the Bible actually proves to have the most accurate copy. And I have this super nerdy slide for you guys. Um, there's this guy named Plato. He didn't invent the dough that you play with in kindergarten. He actually is, like, really smart philosopher and teacher. But his manuscript documents, all that fun stuff, had two copies written in 100, 1,000 and 200 years. But the Bible had 6,600 copies in just 17 years. You see way more copies in a less amount of time. But yet more people will say that Plato's works are true and reliable and trustworthy than the Bible. But the Bible, historically, is more accurate. It has more um, evidence with accurate copying. So we just nerded out on the C, so we're going to now nerd out on the F. F in Chick-fil-A potato waffles stands for historical facts. Historical facts. If you write, if you have the Bible claiming it's true, if you put a historical fact in there that is wrong, it contradicts it. The Bible has tons and tons of facts. One, for example, is there was a guy named Caesar Augustus who issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Well, in all the history books and everything we know, there was a guy named Caesar Augustus who issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and it happened. And anywhere else in the Bible, every historical fact that is there, none of them contradict what we know about history, what we know um, about the world. It's all completely accurate. There are zero that contradict. Okay, Chick-fil-A, A, stands for archaeology. This one is my favorite. I totally nerd out on this one, and I love this one. But archaeology is um, when you, like, dig up a city or you dig up fossils or bones or shells or, I don't know, gold, whatever you want to do. You dig up things, and you find stuff that prove history or prove what someone has says, said. And so some people say, you know what? The Bible has these, like, crazy stories with these places that no one has ever been, no one has ever seen. Like, there's no way. It's a fairy tale land, like in a land far, far away that's what the Bible is like. We have no proof for it. Well, actually, archaeology proves that that we, the places in the Bible talked about, the people in the Bible talked about are actually real. One of my favorite ones is Jericho. Have you guys ever heard of Jericho? I'm going to sing the, the cheesy song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. No one? Okay, cool. Thank you. Just the old, there's worship team. We're, we're, on, the same, we're on the same vibe now. Okay, so we can put Jericho up there. So Jericho, in the Bible, um, God has his people, the Israelites, march around the, the city and the walls actually fall out. Normally, if you're going to conquer a city, the walls will fall in because you're, like, trying to get into the city. The, the walls fall out in the Bible, and then only one part of the wall is still standing because there's a woman named Rahab who helps the Israelites. And so her family's in there. That part of the wall stays. And then God tells the people in the Bible, the Israelites, not to take this stuff from the city, not their grain, not their treasure, all that stuff. Just conquer the city and move on. And so when they dig up this site... They find a city, all the walls fallen out except for one part of the wall, and everything was still left inside. Doesn't contradict the Bible at all. It actually proves the Bible. And there are over 23,000 archaeological digs. Every single one of them prove the Bible. And today they're still constantly digging up more and more. It's crazy in Israel if you're to buy a plot of land and you're like, I'm going to build a gas station. And you start digging in the gas station and you're like, oh, man, I just found an archaeological dig. You have to pay for it to be done. So no matter what, like things are being dug out and found out. And it's just proving the Bible more and more and more. P in Chick-fil-A, potato waffles. We're at the potato now. We are at prophecy. Prophecy. This makes me think of, like, Lord of the Rings, but I've never seen Lord of the Rings, so I have no idea if that makes sense at all. Is there prophecy in Lord of the Rings? Cool. Maybe Star Wars? Maybe Harry Potter? I don't know. One of those. It just sounds mystical and magical, but prophecy, a prophet would send a message. A prophecy um, predicts something that's going to happen. And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when the Old Testament was written, there's all these prophecies about Jesus, about the Messiah, of things he's going to do, what he's going to do, all these things, prophecies. And, the ch and we know from super scientific carbon dating of when that was written down. They can look at paper. Guys, it's so nerdy, but so cool. They can look at paper. And with the scientific carbon dating, you can know, like, when it was written down. So they have the paper, the manuscripts, um, some of them called the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they um, were written down 150 years before Jesus even was on this earth. And the chances of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the prophecies that were written down 150 years before is one to the 17th power. That means one with 17 zeros, the chance of one in one to the 17th power. 
So you're like, okay, cool, math, whatever. Let me just give you a better picture. You see Texas there? So imagine you take Texas, fill the entire surface area of Texas two feet deep in quarters. You cover, you paint one quarter red, pink, blue, whatever color you want to do. You blindfold someone, have them walk the entire surface area, and then pick one. The chances of them doing that is one in 17th of power. But Jesus fulfills 300 plus prophecies, 300 pro pro plus prophecies in the Old Testament, and the chance of just doing eight of them is Texas. So the fact that they can prove that proves to us that the Bible is trustworthy, that we can use this as a standard of truth. And the last one is eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses. That is our W, our waffle, witnesses. Which I guess if you're a witness to this, you should be given waffles because waffles are wonderful. I know, that's great. Never mind. Okay, so eyewitnesses. So there's people who actually saw Jesus, saw him die on the cross, rise again, all these things. And they're witnesses to the events that happened. They're witnesses. There's historical documents that aren't from the Bible that say Jesus was a real person. He died. Um, like no historian like disagrees with the fact that Jesus was a real person or that he was crucified. Everyone believes that. Like any like rational person knows that. But what's crazy is imagine if you and your friends get together and you're like, we want to make a ton of money. So let's come up with a new religion on a mermaid, a mermaid named Greg that we found beneath the L.A. city in the sewers. And when you, like, shine a flashlight on Greg, the mermaid from the L.A. sewers, he sparkles money, and we're just going to get so rich. So we're going to tell people this because then people will worship us. They'll come to our church. They'll ask, how do we get Greg so we can get this money? And so you become famous. You write books. You have this, like, your own Bible, which is a book of your beliefs and how you live. And then you get on Ellen. You get on Oprah, and you're so famous. And then you're all over there snickering like, ha-ha. They have no idea. We just made this up. We're so good at this. Like, no one would disagree with Greg the Mermaid. And then someone comes up to you one day in an alley and holds a gun to your head and says, is it true? Is Greg, do <laughs> oh, shoot. Is it true? Is it true? Did you make this up? Anyone in their rational mind who knows they made this up would not die for this lie because you made it up. You would choose to live. But guess what? The disciples who believed that Jesus died on the cross and rose again decided, they, they not decided, they did. They died for the truth. They didn't die for a lie. You see, we have here Peter crucified, James beheaded, John boiled in oil and exiled, Andrew crucified, Philip stoned, Thomas tortured, burned and impaled, Bartholomew flayed and beheaded, Matthew nailed to the ground and beheaded, James thrown from the temple, Simon Thaddeus crucified and beaten, and Paul beheaded. If any of, like, someone was like, hey, sure, I'm going to nail you to the ground and behead you, um, I'd be like, it's made up. Greg's not real. I'm sorry. My bad. But they died because they were witnesses of this truth. That is how we take any historical document in history and know we can trust it. And that is how we can know we can use the Bible as our standard for truth when we're going to fact check what we believe and why we believe what we do. But the question is, a lot of people believe the Bible. They believe we can trust it because of Chick-fil-A potato waffles. But there's Christians here at this church, here in this room, in other denominations, that what they believe about the Bible is very different. What they believe about the Bible. See, what you believe about the Bible determines how you read it, how you use it, if you read it, how it guides your life or it doesn't guide your life. You may know that the Bible is trustworthy because of Chick-fil-A potato waffles, but what you know and what you believe about it determines so much of your life. So before I even tell you the four important things that we know about the Bible that gives us the perspective on when we read it and how we use it to check the facts of our life, I want you to use the space that says what I believe about the Bible. Write down what you believe about the Bible. Do you believe it's important? Do you believe it's trustworthy? Do you believe it's literal? Do you believe it's figurative? Do you believe it's a, uh, just a fairy tale? Do you think it's a thing of the past? Do you think there's errors in it? Do you think it's made by man? Do you think um, it clashes with culture, so we should just pull some stuff out? Do you think, no, all of it's good, parts of it's good? You like it, you don't like it. Write down what you believe about the Bible. I'll give you 10 seconds. Just remind you, 10 seconds is how one kid dies every 10 seconds of hunger. So this should encourage you for Star to Serve. Very dramatic, but very true. No dramatic news this time, just awkward silence. So the reason I'm having you write it down first is because you need to fact check what you believe. If you don't address first what you believe about the Bible, how are you going to know what, what the Bible is really about? So let's look at it. First one, 
The Bible is inspired by God. The Bible is inspired by God. This means that the Bible was breathed out by God. That means it is not man's words, but it is God's words. It means that God, he inspired the Bible, but he, he is the one who breathed out, spoke his words, and man recorded it for him. It's not like, oh, Shar wrote the Bible. Like, this is what I wrote down. This is what I think we should do. This is what I think about Jesus. It's my opinion and my belief. No, it is God's words that was written down through man. And this is important for us because it means, we're going to talk about what this means. It means that we have access to God's words. We have God's words. We have them. His actual words. Some of us as Christians think, you know what? It would be so nice if I could just see Jesus, God, face to face and talk to him and ask him about this problem and this issue and why my parents divorced and why I struggle with this and why my friends did that or how do I do this or how do I do that? I, I, I just wish I could sit down and have coffee with God, maybe ice cream, maybe play Xbox Live and have our headsets, have a deep conversation. That's what I would love to do. But, you know, we can't. We can. We have God's words right here in the Bible that we can trust, that we know is reliable. And it's his words. It's not just these old men with beards who wrote stuff down. It's God's word, his letter to you. But too often we make excuses of it's too hard to read. I don't have time. It's boring. The creator of the world, the creator of you, the the savior of the world who died on the cross rose again for you so you could live eternally and not pay for your sin, wrote his words for you and we have it access to us. Today, we have it in access to us in more ways than we could have ever imagined. Online, on your phone, on an app, in every different version you could have, we have God's word. And that's why it's so important to know it's inspired by God. It's his words, not men, not Shara's, not Travis's. It's God's word. Next thing that's so important to know about the Bible is that the Bible is without error. The Bible is without error. A fancy church word for this is inerrant, but it literally means without error, so we'll just stick with that. It means that the Bible is completely true 100%. It's not that, oh, this part is messed up. It's not like, oh, just this section, this part's a little messed up, so I should fix it or I should change it. You see, when people operate that there's errors in the Bible, they then get to put their own human ideas in of like, oh, you know what? God said we should not get drunk. Like, don't be filled with the spirit of drunkenness. But I think God forgot to say, except for on Tuesdays, because that's when we're allowed to. Like, that's the error. I'm just going to insert that in there, and then it'll be good. That gets dangerous because when we believe that there's errors and we have to fix it, there's chaos and confusion. We don't know what's real or what's not because we start filling in our own things. When the Bible is without error, unlike some of the other Bibles, belief books of like Mormonism that has errors that they have to keep changing and fixing, or the Quran um, and the Islamic culture where they have to like literally there's dates and things in there that are completely wrong and cities in there that weren't ever existed yet. There's, there's errors in there, but in the Bible, we have, the, we have something without error because it's God's word. It means for us personally that God can be trusted. It means that God can be trusted. If there was a bunch of errors in the Bible of Jesus saying, like, you know, of God in the Bible saying, like, oh, one thing, like, Jesus is God, and then on the next page says, oh, Jesus is not God, and you're like, um, these contradict what I do. Do I pick one? I don't know which one to trust. That's the world we live in. Like, when you're on Instagram and someone posts something that's their opinion or something that say, this is factual evidence, and you read it, and you're like, oh, that sounds good. And then you scroll down a little bit more, and someone says the exact opposite and says, this is factual evidence. And then you're like, oh, crap, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to believe. And then what's worse is then the fact checker thing comes up, and you're like, maybe the fact checker's right. Are the fact checkers right or the Instagram people right? I don't even know, and I'm confused, and I don't know what to believe. I don't know who to trust. I don't know how to operate. I don't know how to do my life. Maybe it's just me getting stressed out all the time, but I don't know who to trust or who to believe. But because God's word is his word and it has no errors, we can trust him. Trust him enough to do what he says and live the way that he tells us to. The third one about the Bible, why it's so important to know this, is that the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is sufficient. In 2 Timothy, I'm going to turn there for you. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Everything we need in this life is contained in this book. It's complete. 
everything we need in this life is contained in this book. You see, what we've been given, this Bible, we don't have to add to it. There's nothing else we have to add to it. It's not like, okay, we have the Bible, and I really need my experience as well. Or the Bible and my feelings. Like, I, th- that's how it works. Or the Bible and then that book someone else wrote. Your feelings, your experience, a book someone else wrote can contribute and can affirm things in the Bible, but the Bible alone itself is sufficient for everything you need in this life. Um, and that means it contains everything we need for life. And here's the, here's the catch. It contains everything we need for life. That's the key word, need. The Bible's not going to tell me how to use Instagram, not going to tell me what to do when I have an ear infection. It's not going to tell me, like, how to, like, dress cooler. It's not going to tell me what to do when I need to change a tire on my car. But it tells me everything that we need. What we need is a Savior. What we need is salvation. And that Bible tells us everything about that through the Jesus Christ, through the gospel, through the good news. That's what we need to know. It tells us our identity, our purpose, our plan. You see, when someone tells you you're stupid and you're not worthy of love, the Bible says, I'm sufficient for you. Come to me and I'll tell you the truth about who you are. You are a child loved by God. When, when you feel like, oh, I, I, I messed up too bad. I could never be forgiven. The Bible will tell you what you need. It's God's forgiveness. Where the world's going to tell you, well, you need to self-help. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to make yourself look better. You need to spend time, like, meditating. The Bible is sufficient for everything we need in this life. Whether we experience something, feel something, or told something, we want to filter it through Scripture because Scripture is sufficient for everything that we need. And the last one about the Bible that is so important is that the Bible is eternal. The Bible is eternal. Psalm 119 says, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. The Bible is forever. It's always been, always will be. And that means that the Bible is not outdated. The Bible is not outdated. So, like, growing up and even now, I've always thought, like, skinny jeans and a side part was, like, the coolest thing possible. But apparently that's super outdated now where I should be wearing, like, the mom jeans with the flare and a middle part. Apparently, that's all over social media now. My look is completely outdated. And so, therefore, I need to change it, and I need to modify it. That's what it means to be outdated. But, you guys, the Bible is not outdated. But people will argue that, you know, the Bible's outdated. The Bible says that we should wait to have sex before we're married. That's so old-fashioned. That's like 1900s old school. Like, that doesn't apply to our current culture. Everything, it talks about the sanctity of life, abortion, transgender, homosexuality, how I, how I do my life, how I do my finances, how I love my friends. That's just like old school. We live here and now. The Bible is just kind of behind. It's just traditional. It's like a good reference. No, the Bible is eternal. It is not outdated. It is, it is not go out with the culture. The culture changes, but the Bible doesn't. It is unchanging. And it is sufficient for everything that we need. It's sufficient for everything that we need. These four things about the Bible being God's word and not man's word, about it being without error so we can trust God, that it's sufficient with everything that we need and eternal, lasting forever, is key to how we read the Bible Because if you don't believe that about the Bible, you're just going to pick and choose what you want. You're going to, you do you, I do me, you believe that, I believe that, it'll be all good, capiche, woo, cool. But when we read it through the lens of the truth about the Bible, knowing that we can trust it because of Chick-fil-A, potato waffles, it changes how we live it out. And so I want to challenge you guys to read your Bible. That's your challenge. Read your Bible. Read your Bible knowing It is God's word to you. It is everything you need in this life. It is perfect without error. Even when you read something and you disagree with it, it is perfect without error because it's God's word. It's sufficient for you, and it's never going to change. When you have something that amazing that doesn't compare to anything else in this world, why wouldn't you want to open this up or just leave it on your shelf and collect dust? The challenge challenge is for you. Are you going to read it or just going to let it sit there? Because God wants to transform you as you read it, as you open it up, as you spend time with him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time together, Lord, where we get to learn about your word and how we can trust it and how we can use your word as truth when we fact check everything we do, Lord. Help us to remember that your word is everything that we need. It's without error. It is your truth, Lord. In your name we pray.